Okay, um, welcome back everyone. Welcome to the exercise class. Let's start. I think today we'll take only half of the exercise class to cover everything I want to, so it won't be for long. Um, okay, so the first thing, so I think all the things that we're going to do today were already announced in the, in the lecture. So first we'll look at the um, like pre and post selection paradoxes and uh, at this probability function extension. Um, that we needed to define in order to uh, define what a paradox is. And we'll prove some of the um, properties of this uh, function and also of the pre and post selection states. So just to remind you uh, what we did, we, we took the probability function, which was initially defined on the, uh, on the set of, of projectors, and then we we extended the set of projectors so that also the complements of the projectors are included. Also, the projectors commuted. Then their um, their multiplication was also included, and so on. And then uh, the final probability function, which is extended to that space, would be would satisfy three following uh, conditions. First, that it is indeed some sort of probability function. So it's between one, uh, z zero and one. So again, to remind you, f of p is a notation that we use for probability of measuring projector p given the pre and post selection by m psi. Uh, yeah, so this is the first uh, necessary property, then the second is that the f of identity is one and the f of zero is zero. Also very natural. And the last one is about two projectors, P and Q. If they commute, then from this it follows that f of P plus Q minus pq equals f of p plus f of q minus f of pq. So let me clarify something I didn't clarify last time. So uh, why are we indeed allowed to put this, um, this sum as an argument of f? So say that we have our, so we define this probability function for the projectors belonging to, so last time we called a thing A prime to this uh, space of projectors. So um, if P is in, a, in the A prime, um, then one identity minus P is also an A prime because um, A prime is complete with respect to the projectors in this sense. And Q, is an n prime a prime, then one minus q is also an a prime. And this means that if p and q commute, as in this in this case, then identity minus p and identity minus q also commute, which means that identity minus p multiplied by identity minus q is also in this space. And this is this can be rewritten as identity uh, minus p minus q plus pq. And since this projector is in the A prime, this means that the complement of this projector is also in A prime. So identity minus this is also in A prime. And given that we can write this uh, multiplication in the following way, we can see that uh, this is actually equal to p plus q minus pq. So it has to be an A prime. So basically that's why we're allowed to uh, put this expression there as an argument. Okay. Uh, so, very good. So the first thing that was already announced in the lecture um, we're going to prove is that the overlap between the pre and post selection uh, 
Okay, let's say that phi is the pre, uh, pre selection, so prepared state. And psi is post selection. Uh, then the overlap between these two is bigger than zero and less than one to have a paradox. So if we have a paradox, this, this must uh, be satisfied. So, okay, so let's, let's see how we can, how we can get to this conclusion. So basically, um, if we have a paradox, then we need some projector which gives us the probability one with respect to this probability f of p. So we have this projector p, f of p. Uh, we can write f of p, which is the probability of measuring p uh, given the pre and post selection. Sorry, I write phi in two different ways, but it's both of them are phi. So, and this we can write um, according to the rule we've seen yesterday. So this is just psi p phi over psi p phi plus the same for the second projector, which is the complement of the p. And this has to be equal one, which means that the psi identity minus p phi has to be zero. Um, this means that the phi of psi phi um, should be equal to psi of p phi. And this has to be, uh, for this probability in order to be one, this has to be bigger than zero, which means that the overlap or overlap between the pre and post selected state has to be non-zero. So from this, it follows that. Uh, yeah, the modulus of this. Uh, is bigger than zero. Okay, so this is from uh, the bound from below. Now for the bound from above, which will say that the overlap has to be strict, uh, strictly less than one. Uh, okay, so suppose that indeed we, we arrive to the situation where we have a paradox and the overlap between uh, these two pre and post selected states is one. So the modulus of this expression is one. What would this mean for these two states? It would mean that the post selected state or the pre selected state is, differs from the, um, from the post selected state um, by a factor of a phase. So Basically, it means that we can write that the post-selected state equals e to the power i eta, uh, the prepared state. Okay, um, and if we write it like this, then yeah, the overlap is just this phase, and psi p phi is equal to, so, e to the power minus i eta uh, phi p phi um, and the f of p in this case, which, which, we write, which we wrote there, so we just substitute our findings. So when we take the modulus, for example, we don't care about the phase anymore. 
So basically what we would get is uh, phi p phi, um, phi p phi plus um, phi 1 minus p phi. Since these are projectors, then actually this this is guaranteed to be real so that we don't even need the the moduluses here um and basically what we get in the denominator is just the scalar product of phi with itself and in the denominator just the usual like born rule like probability of getting outcome corresponding to um, the protector p. But if we take, but if we define the f of p in this way, which just corresponds to the usual Born probability, then all of these three rules that the probability function has to satisfy are automatically satisfied because they, they are all they, yeah, they're all true for these type of defined probability. So basically, from this, it follows that. Um, it, the probability is defi defined in such a way that all these three conditions are satisfied and hence there is no paradox, which we initially, um, we, which we suggested initially, which means that in fact, so this is no paradox and then we know that for the paradox we need that this is less than one. So one important message I think that you should uh, get out of this is that uh, to, get, um, to get a logical paradox out of a quantum setting, you actually need pre and post selection. Um, so you need this, um, overlap between pre and post selection, which is neither zero nor one. So for example, if you pre and post select on the same state, you will never find a paradox. If you pre and post select on orthogonal states, you also never find a paradox. Uh, so pre and post selection is very important for this. Okay. Uh, this was considering the overlap between pre and post selection. And now we'll consider just some uh, two properties of this probability function, which are very intuitive if you think about um, yeah, the quantum setting. So for example, or just actually a usual probability setting. So the first thing we're gonna prove is that, uh, so if we have P and Q which commute, uh, then F of PQ is less or equal than F of P. Um, and this is this is very natural because the prob so uh, this probability of PQ, for example, could be could correspond to the probability of first measuring P and then adding the measurement of Q, and then this one is just measuring P, and of course this probability has to be less than just the probability of measuring P. Okay, so how do we prove this? Uh, let us introduce the two, two new projectors, P uh, prime, which is PQ, and Q prime, which is P identity minus Q. Because, uh, yeah, so we are proving this, of course, for the case where P and Q commute. So because P and Q commute, uh, trivially, because P prime and Q prime are just functions of P and Q. P prime and Q prime also commute. So in fact, um, in fact, for them, we, then we just use the third um, third property of the probability function. So we just write it out, basically. So F of yeah P prime plus Q prime minus P prime Q prime. Uh, equals f of p prime plus f of q prime uh, minus f of p prime q prime. So what is p prime q prime? 
right now. Uh, so it's just PQ, P, identity minus Q. Um, Q and identity minus Q are orthogonal to each other and Q and P commute. So we can just shuffle around these, uh, these projectors in the expression and we'll get zero. Okay. Um, and given this result, we just substitute it in this expression. So what we get is F of P prime plus Q prime prime and P prime plus Q prime is in fact just P. Uh, yeah, minus zero. So that's it. So F of P is equal to F of uh, PQ plus F of uh, P identity minus Q uh, minus F of zero, which is according to the second property of the probability function is zero. Um, and then according to the first property, the probability function is always positive, which means that this expression uh, on the, on the right-hand side is always bigger or equal than just one term from this expression, which is f of pq, and hence we arrive to this property. Um, okay, then the second property, this is clear, right? Yeah. Um, then the second property is also intuitively very easy to see. So f of p is one minus f of identity minus p. So basically, this so you either either measure p or you measure its complement, and the sum of these two probability has has to um, be one because there is no other option. Uh, okay. To do this, we'll again use the third rule. And we're going to take P prime as just P and Q, Q prime as identity minus P. Okay, so again, P prime and Q prime commute. And moreover, P prime, Q prime is just zero. And we can apply the third property again. And what we get is f of p plus identity minus p minus zero, which is p prime q prime, equals f of p plus f of identity minus p minus f of zero. And this is zero, and hence we arrive to our desired expression because this is identity and f of identity is one. Okay, so this was all concerning this uh, probability function. Um, now we move to a different, different thing which are uh, TPCPMs. and some properties of TPCTPMs and how they can be expressed um, um, in terms of, or the other way around, how a projective measurement can be expressed in terms of TPCPM. So TPCPM is this representation uh, of quantum channel, so with a trace preserving completely positive map. And this is um, somehow the most general way to um, describe the evolution of the quantum system. Whenever, for example, it's, we've already seen it. So for example, when it's coupled to the environment and then we don't want to care about the environment, we only care about the system itself. So then we write the evolution on the system uh, individually as a quantum channel. Um,
Okay, so something that we're going to prove now is uh, the way you can uh, understand a projective measurement as a probabilistic application of a quantum channel. So basically, say that we have a set of projectors, PJ, um, and then there exists um, there exists a TPCPM epsilon such that uh, and also there exists a Q of some probability between zero and one um, such that we can always write the state after the projective measurement which is usually written as the sum over j, pj, rho, pj, um, as if we performed the following operation. So with the probability q, we left the state as it is. And with probability 1 minus q, we applied uh, quantum channel epsilon. Okay, so yeah, we're just gonna prove this fact. And to do so, um, let us assume that the indices J, they run from one to N. So there are N projectors. And um, we're gonna look at the vectors um, in n-dimensional real space, X, which run from X1 to Xn. But the components of these vectors would only take the values plus and minus one. And we will call the set of such all such vectors as x. So we can say that x is all vectors x such that um, these conditions are satisfied. OK. Um, then given this set x for each of these small vectors x in this set let us introduce a unit <coughs> um, a linear combination of of projectors corresponding to a particular vector x so it's going to be some uh, we call it ux which will be sum over j um, xj pj so this is um, this construction corresponds to, to a particular vector x from, from, from this set. Uh, in fact, this construction is unitary. This is easy to check. So what we, what we need to check is ux dagger um, ux. So this will be sum over j um sum over say j prime um xj's are real so i don't need to conjugate them yeah the projectors um are hermitian so i'll just get xj pj xj prime pj prime uh because pj's are projectors then pj pj prime would be equal to Uh, pj delta j j prime so it's not zero only when uh, j equals j prime which means that this is reduced to just one sum um, xj squared uh, pj xj squared um, would always give you one because xj is plus minus one, which means that this is just sum over pj's and they're projectors, so they sum up to identity. Okay, uh, so indeed this one is a unitary. Okay, um, now let us look at the following construction. So, um, 
Yeah, okay, maybe one thing we look at before that is the following sum. So sum over j, k, x, j, x, k, yes. So x, j, x, k. Uh, so we're looking at the sum for a particular uh, vector x in this, um, in this set, big X. So what would be the sum? Ah, sorry. Uh, is this? Ah, oh, no, yes, we're looking at a bit different object. So we're looking at the sum of xj, xk, and we sum over all x's in, the, in this big set x, and then uh, we're looking at the sum as depending on j and k. Uh, so can someone tell me what the sum would be like? What is the result? Uh, not always, y zero. It's yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so two 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 different um, cases we can consider. The first case is when j equals k. So if if j equals k, then we just have sum over all x in x x j squared and x j squared is always one. So we effectively just counting the number of vectors in our, in our set, which is two to the power n. And if j is not equal to k, then indeed, or due to the symmetrical reasons, because we will have um, the same number of combinations of uh, when xj and xk are one, one, one minus one, minus one, one, and minus one, minus one, we'll have the same number of these. And then this will give us one, minus one, minus one, and one, and in total, this will give us zero. <clears throat> so we can just write this out as two to the power n delta jk. Okay, um, now we will use this, uh, this expression um, when we will consider the following expression. So we'll consider sum over all x's uh, in, in, the, in the set x. Um, u x rho u x dagger. And to normalize, we'll divide this by two to the power n. Okay, so now we just have to substitute the definition of ux. So what we would get is one over two to the power n, sum over x, uh, sum over j, sum over k, it's gonna be xj, xk, uh, pj, rho, p, k, yes. Okay, now we know that the sum over all x's of xj, xk would be two to the power n delta jk. So effectively we're only left with one sum over j. Um, pj rho pj. Um, yeah, and two to the power of m is here, coming from there, so our normalization just cancels out. Okay, so we're almost there. Basically, uh, now let us divide this sum, this big sum into two parts. So I'll, I'll just separate two vectors, uh, which are the x, which has all components uh, plus one, and the x, which has all components minus one. 
So for this x, uh, we'll just have sum over j's pj. So basically, we would have ux, which is identity. And for this one, we'll have sum over uh, minus pi j. So we'll have minus identity. And if I separate these two, then what I will get is identity rho identity plus minus identity rho minus identity. So effectively the same thing. Plus uh, 1 over 2 to the power n. Um, sum over x's, which are not equal to these two vectors. So they're not equal to plus minus this vector. Okay. Uh, and then if I choose q, which is equal to 2 to the uh, 2 divided by 2 to the power n, so 1 divided by 2 to the power n minus 1, then, in fact, I get my desired result due to the, to the fact that uh, we can always write the TPCPM as a in form of the Krauss representation. Okay, so yeah, this is this might be sometimes useful to think about uh, the projective measurement as this probabilistic application of a uh, completely positive map. Okay, uh, that's almost it, except for one last thing that was again advertised in the lecture, where we'll, we would look at the quickly look at the uh, joint. Uh, quantum channel to the usual TPCPM channel. Okay, so if we have a TPCPM um, epsilon, which takes a state from uh, the space of the operators uh, endomorphisms on uh, Hilbert space A to the space of the endomorphisms on, on the Hilbert space B, um, then we can always, for, for this TPCPM, we can always define an adjoint map, which I'll label as uh, epsilon dagger, which will go the other way around. And the way we define it is that the following has to hold. So for any row A in endomorphisms of uh, H A and any say sigma B in the endomorphisms of H B, the following has to hold. So the trace of epsilon, sorry, E of rho A sigma B should equal to trace of Row A, um, E dagger of sigma B. I'll explain the meaning of this in a moment when we'll derive how this looks. Um, and given this representation, it's easy to um, to derive uh, the way this adjoint actually looks. So for this, we can use the Krauss representation of the quantum channel, um, E. So according to the Krauss representation, we can find the set of Krauss operators such that I can write this as sum over k, ek, rho a, ek deck. 
So then I can write the left hand side of this trace equality as trace of sum over k e k rho a e k dagger um, sigma b. Um, because trace has the cyclic property, this is equal to just sum over k uh, rho a e k dagger sigma b e k. And I can, because rho a doesn't go into the sum, I can just exchange them. And then on the right hand side, I would have the Krauss representation of the adjoint channel. Why is it still the Krauss representation? Um, well, because here for these Krauss operators, it holds that the sum is identity and the adjoint channel has the Hermitian conjugates of these operators. So this, um, so basically their semi-definite uh, semi positivity is preserved as well as the, this, uh, this sum expression. Okay, uh, what is the meaning of this, of this representation? So one can think about this as, so for example, imagine um, that these are, these are not necessarily density matrices, right? So it just have to, has, have to be some operators in this endomorphism space. So for example, this can be observables as well. And then this expression is exactly uh, what it means to go from Schrodinger picture into the Heisenberg picture. Because for example, imagine that sigma b is just some observable on the system A. Then one way to um, kind of measure the probability of, of measuring this observable would be to evolve the system itself and then calculate the probability of that observable of measuring that observable, or this would be the usual Schrodinger picture, or just keep the system as it is and instead evolve the, um, the observable. And this would be like the Heisenberg picture. So this is kind of one interpretation um, yeah, of this procedure. Okay. Uh, yes, I think I think this is everything that I had for today. So these were just the tools that Lydia used in, in the proofs in the lecture. Um, so it means that we are almost done with the paradoxes, except for the paradoxes with where we would use the weak measurements and weak values. And for such um, the similar theorem as you saw in the lecture can be, can be, can be formulated. But I think that will migrate to the that exercise migrates to the next week because we still haven't talked about the weak values in the lecture, uh, and then the rest the rest of the course is on clocks. So, yeah, um, yeah. If you have any questions, feel free to to ask. Yeah. So for today, that's all. No, I, I, I deleted them from that, so yeah, don't worry about that. So they're only gonna go into the next week.